Amen. All right, well, while you're standing there, you can grab your Bible and open to the book of Colossians. Um, Miss Pat and Brother Warner, I just want to say thank you to y'all. Y'all have been faithful for many, many years, both of you for many years, um, coming in and playing for us. And I just, you know, I'm just... I'm just thankful for it tonight. No, no particular reason to say that. I just, I just want to say thank you. It's a, it's a blessing to have you. And it would not be the same if we were singing a cappella in here. Um, so uh, I, I just, I really appreciate it. I know it takes a lot, and you come here a lot of times when you have other things going on, and it's, uh, but your faithfulness is not unnoticed. I appreciate it. Um, Colossians chapter number one, and we'll um, start in here in verse number one. Uh, more of a teaching kind of a service tonight because we're getting started in the book of Colossians. So let's just um, start here in verse number one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. you may be seated. Uh, brother Manning just prayed, so we won't pray again here. But um, we have... we've. Uh, I spent just a few weeks preaching through Jeremiah about the Word of God, and uh, lest we belabor that too much, I'm going to go ahead and move into uh, the, the book that preacher asked, um, asked us to get into um, after Jeremiah, and this is it, Colossians here. Colossians is one of my favorite books in the Bible. You probably hear me say that a lot about several different books. I do have a few books. They're not all my favorite, but I, I, mean, I, do, have, I do have a few favorites. Um, it's like that guy talks about the, you know, when the kid gets icy after a baseball game or something, you know, which, which flavor is your favorite? Well, strawberry and, and blueberry, you know, and cherry. So they're all favorites, right? They're all, they're all good. Um, but Colossians is a good book. If you're looking for some of my favorite books, Isaiah is absolutely just phenomenal book to, just to read through. It's a blessing. The book of Hebrews is a great, great book to read through. Um, and the book of Hebrews is interesting because if you listen to it from Alexander Scorby, if you'll you know, listen to him uh, talk through it, it takes about 45 minutes to go through it um, in audio. And I think that Hebrews actually was, was written kind of like a sermon. And when you listen to it, it, it kind of comes across differently than when you read it. It's meant to be, it's meant to be heard. It's meant to be listened. Now, of course, it's meant to, the Bible says, to seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read uh, but at the same time, you ought to try listening to your Bible sometimes. You know, when the King James translators were making your Bible, do you know how they edited it? This is just a kind of a little aside here. How they edited it, how they, how they put it together was the translators would go, you know, they had these different teams that would translate different sections of the Bible. And then one group would go and they'd translate it. They'd come back in, and instead of handing them all manuscripts or copies of what they had translated, all, the group would sit out there and then one person would stand up and they would, or they would sit down there and they would read the passages, read the section that had been translated, and they would listen to it and make sure that it sounded good to the ear, make sure that it sounded good. And that this, you know, the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Sometime you ought to just try listening to the Bible. It's a blessing that we have uh, the audio that we have available today. You know, we can do that. We have recordings and things. Um, otherwise, man, you'd have to make your wife read it to you or something just to, to be able to, uh, to hear it. But it's a blessing you have that availability, and I promise you, you will, you will get something out of it if you'll just sit down and listen to the book of Hebrews start to finish. It'll take you about 45 minutes. Um, Colossians is another great book. It's not anywhere near as long as Hebrews is. It's only four chapters, but it is an absolutely great book. Now, look at uh, a couple things. Um, it... <laughs> I kind of struggled back and forth about preaching or teaching. This is the preaching hour, but we're just getting into it, so we need to do a little bit of a teaching overview on it. Um, but look at, uh, let's see, there's a few different places that, that, uh, that you'll see some things mentioned here. Look at, first of all, I didn't write it down, so I don't, I don't have it with me. Look over towards the end of the book, Colossians chapter 4. I know it's mentioned a couple times at the end of the book here. Colossians chapter 4. It's in verse 13, it says, I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea. You all recognize that Laodicea, right? And not for a good reason, for, for how they're rebuked in the book of Revelation, right? Now, you all, you all have been taught here very well. Can you tell me what church age it is that, or church period that it is that we're living in right now? Laodicea, absolutely. It's the last church period before Jesus Christ comes back. And so this book is written 
to a church that is very close to Laodicea. And then you'll see, verse, look at verse number 15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea. And verse number 16, when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. So the, the epistle, this letter that Paul writes here, he sends to the church, it's at Colossae, but it says, you need to go read this to the people that are at Laodicea. So this is very, very helpful. It's going to be very helpful to us today living in the church period of Laodicea. And then look at the, the end of verse 16, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So Paul wrote something to Laodicea, and he said, they're going to apply both ways here. Now, the reason for that is Laodicea and Colossae are only about maybe 10 or 11 miles apart, or we're only about 10 or 11 miles apart. And they're in uh, Asia, Asia Minor, near kind of where Turkey is over there now. And so Colossae was this city. It was kind of a smaller city than Laodicea. Laodicea was a bigger one. But Colossae was a little further south, a little further east from Laodicea, and it was kind of closer to the mountains. And there were mountains over there that were snow-capped mountains and you know what happens when there's, it warms up a little bit. If you're, if you're in a city that's near snow-capped mountains, you have a lot of times um, some rivers, some cool rivers you can go to. And that's what a Colossae was known for. It was known for locally. People would actually travel there and do kind of like ice baths in their, in their uh, rivers there, in, in their little pools that collected at the bottom of these snow-capped mountains there. And Laodicea was a little further north. It was a little further west, um, I believe it was. Um, or east, just uh, on one side or the other, I get them mixed up, but it was a little further north, and so it would catch a lot of the hot springs that would come down from the north. And what would happen in Laodicea is that they would have runoff from the mountains and the snow, and they'd have cold water hitting from the south, and they'd hit, have runoff from the uh, hot rivers and hot springs from the north, and they would meet in the middle in Laodicea. So you'd have this mixture of this hot water coming down from the north and this cold water coming down from the south. Y'all y'all getting the reference there? Um, for those of you who don't know, the Bible says that Laodicea was accused of being lukewarm. He says, you're neither cold nor hot. And it was specifically a, a reference or a play on words back then of exactly what was happening in the city there. And so it, it, we, have to be, we have to be warned by the things that are happening in the, in the book of Colossae because it's very, very similar to the things that we see here in the church today. All right, in, uh, in chapter 4, verse 14, it's a sick church. In chapter 2, verse 8, it, they deal with philosophy. Um, in chapter 2, verse 8, they deal with an abundance of education without God. In 4.18, they're persecuted by Rome. In 3.1, they've lost their heavenly vision. In 3.1, they're seeking out the world instead of heaven. In 3.16, they have a problem with worldly music or wrong music. In 2.8, they're living by the rudiments of the world instead of Christ. In 2.4, they're beguiled by preachers with good words. In 1.16, they're, they're beguiled by false views of creation. And in 1.18, this, uh, they're dealing with people who are seeking the preeminence. And so if that's not just a real good thumbnail view of what we deal with today in, in the church today, in the churches today, then I don't know what, it, know what is. So I pray that this will be helpful to us to be able to study through this and see what's happening here. So go back over to Colossians chapter number 1 if you're not still there. And Paul writes this. It says right there in the, in the, in the title that Paul wrote this to the people at Colossae. Now you'll notice a couple people that he writes it with and he writes it to. See verse number 7. It says, you also learned of uh, Epaphras, or Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Look over at chapter 4, and you'll see him here again. Chapter 4 is typically where, you know how we'll write at the beginning of the letter, we'll say this is to so-and-so and so-and-so, and then we write our name at the end. They just did that in the opposite way. So when you see an epistle, or you, you see in your Bible, especially when I talk to young Christians here, if you see where it says the epistle of Paul or the epistle of Peter, that's a letter. This is literally a letter that Paul sat down and wrote to the church while he was in prison. And he, he addressed it by putting his name at the beginning and the people that he was writing to and writing with at the end of the book. Okay? So look at verse number 7, chapter 4, verse 7. There's Tychicus. He's a, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant. And then do you recognize the name in verse number 9 there? Where do you all recognize his name from? Mm-hmm. Yep, Philemon. So Onesimus and Philemon, they are right there in this church at Colossae. 
So we'll probably take maybe, um, maybe one service, uh, if lo the Lord wills here, and look at the book of Philemon as well as it relates to this book. Because they, they are church members in the same church. The situation where you have a runaway slave and he's, he gets saved and he's sent back home, this is happening in this church here. So it's going to be, there's, there's a lot going on here. Amen. Look at verse number 10. You see Marcus, that's Mark, that's sister son to Barnabas. Now you know what happened with Paul and Barnabas over Mark, but, but Mark is back in this book. He's back. Um, and look, at, look who else is in this book. You Now look at verse 12, there's Epaphras again, who is one of you. So Epaphras is from Colossae. A servant of Christ saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And he's got this great zeal for these people in Colossae. Now look at verse number 14. There's Luke, the beloved physician. So he says all these wonderful things. There's a, my fellow servant, my brethren, your, your laborer. There's, my, there's the beloved physician. And then look at verse 14 as well. Oh, Demas says hi too doesn't say anything about Demas being a fellow servant or a laborer or anything. No, Demas, Demas is there, and he's there always in relation to Mark. Whenever you see Mark, you see Demas, and whenever you see Demas, you see Mark, and you can make a note there to say it doesn't, doesn't matter so much how much you fall, it matters how, how you finish. And I'll tell you, you know, Mark fell. Mark had a falling out with Paul. But he got back on the horse, and he got back in the ministry, and at the end of it, Paul said that this man is profitable unto me, versus Demas, who we don't see Demas ever having a problem with Paul. He's just right there along with Paul the whole time. Demas is there when he writes this letter to Colossae. He is there. Who knows if he possibly even helped him write the letter or helped transcribe it or helped, helped put it down, helped make a copy or helped, helped deliver it. He's right there. Now, I, I'm going to teach through this book and preach through this book. You're, you're going to hear it from Sam Magdalene, the young man from Jacksonville, Florida. Can you imagine hearing this book read out, dictated, verbally inspired by God through the apostle Paul as he's sitting in a prison cell? That's what Demas heard. Yet Demas still fell away. Why is that? The Bible says that Demas fell away because he loved this present world. And I, I'll tell you, you could be sitting in a prison cell with Paul, listening, listening to him dictate Colossians 3.1. That says, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. And it doesn't matter how much you are listening. It doesn't matter how great your preacher is. If it is not sinking into your heart, you'll fall away just like Demas did. You'll fall away just like you did. And I'm talking to some people here today, unfortunately, that, that may fall away. That may. And I can't say anything else to you except warn you um, and, and say, listen, it, it's not about coming to church and sitting in a pew and leaving. If you are leaving church service after church service and your heart is not changing and you're not growing, then be, listen to me. Be warned. You, you don't get this by osmosis. You get it by applica application to your own heart, application to your own life. That's the only way that you're going to grow. That's the only way that you're going to stick to the end. You get it by getting right with God when you fall. This, this altar ought to be a second home to you. When's the last time you came to this altar? Do you have a place here at this altar? If I said, where do you pray? Would you say, oh, I pray right there, and I was just there a, a month ago, a week ago, a couple months ago. I'm not saying you have to be there every service, but has it been two years? Is that because that you haven't had anything to come to, to the altar about for two years? Or because it's possible that you're in a position of Demas, just listening to it and listening to it? Um, so, you know... So the, the, the man here, though, that is a blessing to me is, is Epaphras or Epaphras in verse number 12, chapter 4, verse 12. It says that he's praying for these people at Colossae. Now, it seems from the letter that Epaphras probably, probably led all of these people in Colossae to the Lord himself. Because Paul, it says that he hasn't, it says, I've got this great conflict for you and for everybody else who hasn't seen me face to face. Paul did not lead, lead these people to the Lord. And the best candidate for who did this was Epaphras. And you know what that means? That means this young man got saved, probably it seems like, went to Ephesus or to Rome, wherever it was that Paul was in jail, 
he could have been at either place, probably in Ephesus, is close by. He's over there in jail. And um, Epaphras goes over there, visits him, gets saved from Paul, goes back to Colossae and leads a bunch of people to the Lord and starts pastoring the church right there, right after he got saved. That's what's going on in this book. So in this book, you have this young man who, or maybe an old man, I don't know, but he's a young Christian, and he's, he, is, he has got this great burden for this church that are, that are a bunch of new Christians, that are a bunch of young Christians. And he comes, and, and, and Paul writes a letter to try to help them, and that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing Paul who's trying to, Paul trying to help a bunch of young Christians. So I, I'd like to focus on that just a little bit as we go through this book. I'd like to help some young Christians as we go through this. I'd like to help you, help you with, with the, not, th not through me, not through my own opinions, not through my own experience, not any of that stuff, through the word of God that was written by Paul here, try to pass along what Paul gave to these young Christians to you as a young Christian as well. And if you're more established in the faith, and if, you've, if you say, well, Brother Sam, I'm not a young Christian. I've been saved for a long time and growing the Lord a long time. It may be something that helps you to know better how to help other young Christians that are around you. Because we are tasked, it's those of us that are a little bit older in the faith, and I've always referred to myself as a young man, but I, I'm not feeling like a young man anymore. <laughs> you know, my, I, we, ha, we got a new puppy at the house. Yes, awe is, is, uh, is, is a good man. If you see it, it's... A, it's the cutest dog I've ever seen in my life. It is absolutely beautiful dog. I put the dog outside this morning. You know, I woke up. I just still, you know, in my PJs and walk, walk out in the backyard, um, put, set the dog down. The dog runs right over the pool, looks in the pool, and falls in the pool. <laughs> it's like that, right? So I'm like, I'm awake now. I haven't had my coffee yet, but I'm awake now. The dog is in the pool. If I let this dog drown, my family will disown me. My wife will divorce me. My kids will leave me. It will be, it'll be all over. I can't, I can't do that at this point. So I ran over there to, to grab up the dog, right? And I tweaked my back or something. All I did was bend over to grab the dog out of the pool and, and pull the muscle, you know? So I can't, in good conscience, call myself a young man anymore feels really, I mean, I used to stand up here for years and years saying, I know I'm just a young man. I know I'm just a young man. I don't, I feel like I, I just am not feeling it anymore. Um, so I, I, you know, and, and I'll tell you, when I say something, something about being a young man in the teen class, the kids look at me like, young man. Like, are you looking in the mirror? I mean, are you, are you looking at the same guy that I'm looking at? I, when I was, I was in, over in Pensacola and I said something about how I'd, it's been 20 years since I was in school here. And a kid walked up to me, a student walked up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, when you said it's been 20 years since you were in school, I thought there's no way he's that old. But now that I'm closer, I can see it. <laughs> so, wow. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, but, but I would like to be able to, um, to just to, just to, remind those of us who are a little bit older in the faith, who've been you know, going for a little while, that it's our responsibility to help those who are younger. We have people who are younger who are looking at us, who are looking at our life, who are looking at how we live, but even more so, they, they rely on us in some other ways. And I'd like to go over some of those things with you here today. We're gonna to do just a little bit of an overview of Colossians, it won't take very long, I'm gonna, we'll end before eight o'clock tonight, but I'd like to do a little bit of overview of Colossians so you can see if you're a young Christian, where we're going with this and how it may help you. And if you're an older Christian, how you may be able to help some younger Christians biblically, according to the word. So let's look over at uh, um, chapter number one, Colossians chapter number one. So that's the background of this story here a little bit in the, of, of this book. I hope that you get a new appreciation for it as, as I have studying through it. It's a, it's a real blessing here. Um, and verse number seven, it says, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. That is, Epaphras went back and told Paul, um, these people have uh, a love for Jesus Christ, a love for each other. And then verse nine, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Since the day, they, he, Paul's not ceasing to pray for these young Christians, these new Christians, these baby Christians to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, 
So I will say one more thing tonight. Besides doing an overview of this, I'd like to answer a question that we get from young people all the time. The question that, that, that we get when we do question and answer, preacher does question and answer, we'll get, you know, we'll ask them to turn things in. The question that they turn in, teenagers turn in more than anything else, is how do I know the will of God for my life? How do I know what God's will is for my life? And as you get a little bit older, that question, the answer to that becomes pretty clear. But when you're younger, it's like, I just, you know, I just got right with God. How do I know what he wants me to do? You know? Um, so I think that I'd like to be able to answer that a little bit as well. So if you're a younger Christian, I'm going to try to answer that from this message here. He says, to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience, long suffering, joyfulness, uh, long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. Now, this is Paul's prayer. And then as he goes through the book here, you're going to see how he, how he backs up this prayer with the Word of God and with instruction and guidance. But the very first thing that he's doing is uh, praying for them. He's praying for them. And not just him, but um, Epaphras as well, Epaphras as well. He's praying for them. So the very first thing that I'll say, and this is real simple, but, but us who are older in, in Christ, it is our responsibility to be praying for younger Christians. You see these younger Christians who are coming home from youth camp, or see even younger Christians who aren't teenagers, maybe they're 40 years old, but they're kind of new Christians. It's our responsibility to be praying for them. You look around this church and you say, well, there's a new couple, there's a new young couple, there's a new older couple that have just got saved or something. It's time to put them on your prayer list. It's time to fervently pray for them. You say, what should I pray? Pray this prayer right here, that, that they'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will and how God wants them to grow and how God wants them to walk. Strengthen with all might. This is a great, you can, just, you can pray this prayer for them. But it's our responsibility as people that are older um, to be able to pray for these younger, uh, these younger Christians. And, and I'll say this, as you go through the epistles, you know what you see over and over again? You see all these names of people that we don't know who they are. I mean, we know who the Apostle Paul is, and we know who Luke is because they wrote books, and because we've, we've got that down. But you may not have even really heard of Epaphras. But the church at Colossae was, was there and was thriving because he had this zeal and because he kept on bringing these people before the Lord. Now, what that means is that uh, the, the church does not live on the preacher alone. It re the, the, the church relies on all of us. It relies on me. It relies on you. Not on our good works and what we can do and how we can help out and all that stuff. It relies on our prayers. The, this, the people in this place rely on our prayers. Can you imagine going to a church where you knew for a fact that no one was praying for you or no one was praying for each other? Think about a church like that. If I told you right now that I conducted a survey of everybody in here and found out that no one in this church had prayed for each other in this church at all in the past month, what kind of church would that be? Now that's the type of influence and that's the type of thing that, that you have to think about when you're thinking, what is it that I should be doing? It's not all about, you know, preacher talks about Someone calls up and says, I want to be a Sunday school teacher. Well, it, we got plenty of Sunday school teachers. We got people who graduated Bible school who could teach a Sunday school class. I mean, we, it's, not, it's not about some type of a position. It's not about any of that stuff. I mean, I, I get a chance to preach to you all tonight. How much of a blessing do you think this message would be if no one in here had prayed for me tonight? If you all came in here and just nobody prayed? It doesn't matter if I got up here and sweated and spit and jumped all over. It does not matter. The, 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 the church relies on the saints of God praying for each other. It is the backbone of a church, and we can't let it drop, and we can't let it fall. And you can't say, well, I'm older, I can't do anything in, anymore in the church you, you can still do, and it's not a cliche, and I'm not just saying, you can still do one of the most important things that a church needs, and which is prayer Amen. for the younger Christians that are here, and prayer for each other. We've got, we've just, we've just the, the, the younger, they, they just need the support of the older ones. I mean, you, you look around and you see how dangerous this world is that these kids are going into. 
They, they rely on your prayers. The only reason that there are kids or young Christians that, that become old Christians, in this, the only reason that I came in here as a kid, when I got here, I was 18 years old. 18. And now I'm 25. <laughs> now, I, it's been... Uh, I'm 41, or I'll be 42 this year. It's been 22, 24 years. And the only reason I, that I'm here is because I know that she has been praying for me right there, and Preacher's been praying for me right there, and Brother Brad's been praying for me, and Brother Manny's been praying for me, and I know I can point, I, I know people have been praying for me in here. That's the only reason I'm here. You know what I, you know what I am or was for many, many years? It's, I was that little puppy <laughs> that ran out this morning right, and went straight into the pool. And if it was not for me being out there, grabbing that dog out of that pool, it would not have got out of the pool. It would have fell and been gone. And you know a lot of young Christians who get saved and they fall and they're gone. And part of the reason, part of that is the failure on the part of older Christians. How can you honestly blame a baby Christian for not surviving in the world? On their own, would you? I mean, if I threw that puppy out in the in the world, would you really? Would you blame the puppy if it didn't make it, or would you blame me? Right. See, it's the part of the reason that we don't have more young Christians that survive is because it, it, we we have to take that responsibility on ourselves. We can't say, "Well, these bless God, no, nobody wants it anymore. Nobody wants the truth anymore." They're babies. They're young Christians. I don't say that in a derogatory way. If you just got saved, all of us were babies at one point. And all of us only survived because people helped us. Because a pastor preached to us and a pastor's wife prayed for us and deacons and trustees and church members prayed for each other. We've, we, can't, we can't set that down. We have to keep it up. It starts with prayer. Um, it ends with prayer. And this prayer, part of this prayer, as you see going through here, is for thanksgiving. You say, well, what kind of prayer is it? It's part, partly for thanksgiving. Now, look at, I think I have this written down here. So look at a couple references with me, if you could. Look at verse number 3. Do you see what it says? We give thanks to God. Chapter 1, verse 3. We give thanks to God. Look at verse number 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. Rooted and built up in him, which is what we what we need to be as young Christians. We need to become rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught. Abounding therein with what? Do you see it? 2-7, abounding therein with? Look at, verse, uh, look at chapter 3, verse 15. Chapter 3, 15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye what? Look at verse number 17. Whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everyone knows that part, right? We all have that memorized. Whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at the second half of that verse. Giving what? Thanks to God the Father. Look at chapter 4, verse number 2. It says, continue in prayer and watch in the same, in the same, in prayer with what? Thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. You know, you know what I know about prayer, I know that if your prayer life is not full of thanksgiving, then you are relying on yourself too much. Amen. I know that Brother Ernie brings me a bag of tomatoes every once in a while. I'm going to embarrass you, okay, but you bring other, other people tomatoes. So you're known as bringing people a bag of tomatoes. He just said it's fine. Okay, all right. So he brings me a bag of tomatoes every once in a while. You know, sometimes I buy tomatoes from the store. And I do not go to Brother Ernie after I've bought tomatoes from the store and say, Brother Ernie, I just bought some tomatoes from the store. I just want to thank you. I've never thanked him for tomatoes I bought at the store. Right? Why? Because that was my own money. <laughs> I went and got it myself. He didn't have anything to do with those tomatoes. But when I go out to the car and find a bag of tomatoes in my car, you better believe I'm coming, making a beeline to Brother Ernie and saying, thank you very much for those tomatoes. I made a chili not too long ago with those things and left them real big, and they're just perfect to leave them the big chunks they don't get too uh, soggy and too nasty, you know. They get like, they have a little bit of bite to them still. And it was perfect in that chili, and thank you for those tomatoes. Amen. You know what I know? Your thanksgiving shows what you're, what you're reliant on, what you're depending on. So if you're going through your whole life and you're not, and thanksgiving is not part of your life, what does that mean? Maybe it's time that we 
start relying on the Lord more again. Amen. Watching the same with Thanksgiving. Mm. Um, we, have, we had youth camp last week, and uh, you know what I know about that? I, I know we had, we had a, a couple of young people get saved at that camp. I know we had a couple of young men who said they were called to preach at that camp. I know that we had a bunch of kids who went there and they were spiritually dry and they were like, I need something from God. And when they left, they were lit up. They were close to the Lord and they were saying, I don't even want to go back to the world. I'm so, uh, this is such a blessing to me. That is, that is spiritual fruit. That is something happening that God is doing. And it just, that type of fruit causes me at the end of every single camp to stop and pray and just to thank God and just say, God, thank you so much for everything you've given us. And it's it's become a little bit of a, a little bit of a tradition for me when we're leaving um, the camp on Saturday morning, all the kids are gone. I've got everything packed up and ready to go home. And I'm walking around the chapel, turning the lights out, you know, last one turning the lights out in the chapel. And I will hit that altar before I leave and say, God, I can't believe what you've done here this week, and and thank you for it. There's nothing that we adults, chaperones, preachers could have done to, to, to to see people get saved. That was God. And there are, there, now you know that there are times when you're relying so much, when the, when, the, when the problem is so bad that you have to rely on God so that when it gets fixed, you thank God for it, right? Stand up in church and, you know, I had this disease and God fixed it and thank God for it. But how many times do we end the day saying, God, I had a meeting and it went well and I thank you for it? Um, I had a lot of driving around to do today, and I got home safely, and I thank you for it. You know, it's there. So young Christians, what Paul try, has tried to impress on these young Christians here is the importance and the, the, the central point of thankfulness in your life. You have got to, to make sure that your prayers are often and consistent and thankfulness. You say, what is thankfulness? It is just simply going to God and thanking him for what he's done. If God gave you something, thank him for it. If you prayed about something, God helped you with something, there's thankfulness that needs to be involved there. Young Christians, ask you, you know, think about that. Think about that in your prayer life. Think about that in your time with the Lord. You do not want to be the type of Christian that grows up and learns how to do everything on their own. And, you know, you get up here to sing a song, and it's a blessing, and you leave here, and you, do you thank God? I mean, you prayed to God to help you. You thank God when you're done. You know, this, it's just it's so, so vitally important that we, that we keep that up. All right, look back at uh, chapter number one. We're doing just a little overview here. Uh, chapter number one, verse nine. We're going to dig into all these things as we go through the book, but this is just an overview here. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Okay? So, knowing God's will comes from the next few words there, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So, I'll speak to, especially to the, to the younger Christians here today who are saying, how do I find God's will? How you find God's will is by being filled with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This wisdom comes from Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about some philosophical stuff that you're going to learn when you go to college. I'm not talking about some egghead stuff from some scholar who sits around in the college all day and and philosophizes about, you know, the beginning and about the end and about everything in between and all this and why we shouldn't all... I'm not talking about that type of, uh, of wisdom. I'm talking about practical wisdom. Look over at Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs chapter number 4. The Bible is full of wisdom. But as Brother Broussard said, the Bible is so closely related to Jesus Christ that it's hard to tell them apart sometimes. It's hard to tell which one he's talking about sometimes. 
the wisdom that we have comes from Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified. It's given this personality, and it matches Jesus Christ. It talks about the creation. It talks about where, was, where everything came from. But look at Proverbs chapter number 4. Look at verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of the Father. Attend to no understanding. And look at, look at this. Look at verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Verse 6. Forsake her not. She shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Um, young, young Christians, God founded this world on Jesus Christ. He founded this world with the wisdom of Jesus Christ. The principles that hold this world together, the Bible says, by him all things consist. The principles that hold this whole thing together are found in Jesus Christ. That means if you want to have to be, uh, look, look at, if, if you want to, uh, to live, if you want to be kept, you see this? If you want to be preserved in verse number six, then what you need to do is you need to find out how the world works. You've got to find out how the world works. Now, what a lot of young Christians mean when they say, I want to find the will of God, is I have a decision to make, and I want to pray, and I want to know when I hear a voice, is that my voice or God's voice or the devil's voice? That's what they mean by that, right? And if you're, you've been saved for a while or grown up in the Lord, um, you'll know that is, that is very, very little to do with getting the will of God and finding the will of God. So you've got to, as we said, find out how the world works. I don't mean find out how like the worldly world that's against God, love not the world, works. I'm talking about the earth. I'm talking about the, the underpinnings of how God built this whole thing. You've got to find out how that works. And the way you find that out is by getting close to Jesus Christ, getting close to the wisdom that Jesus Christ has. Look at verse number seven. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding. Um, if, you want, if you want to be able to, to be successful um, at the judgment seat of Christ, Verse number eight, exalt her, she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. Do not listen to, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. Look at verse number 25. Uh, let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left, Remove thy foot from evil. Turn back over to Colossians, if you would, please. Now, this wisdom is something that you are actually applying to your feet. You're getting it in your mind. You're getting it in your heart. This is what God wants me to do. This is where God wants me to go. And you are turning your feet in that direction and saying, I'm not going to let anything pull me to the right hand or to the left from this direction. You, and I have to ask you, young Christian, are you just learning doctrines and learning things about God, or are you? is your life, is your walk changing? Is your direction changing? Amen. The things that you're doing, the things that are coming out of your mouth, the, way, the, the things that you're aiming for, has your aim changed? Good. Are you still looking for what you were before you got right with God, for for a, you know, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or for, a, for money or for promotion, for all these things? Or are you now focused on eternal things and on pleasing Jesus Christ? Don't let the world drag you back into its wisdom. Look at uh, verse number, and we'll, we'll get into all that. Look at verse number 15. It says, that, here's that wisdom, okay? It says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Okay, now I told you the Bible is good to listen to, okay? So if you want to, you can read along, but if you want to, I'm going to give you permission just to listen for a minute, okay? Because this is a poem. This is actually a hymn in this passage. And you may not hear that. The, the, they don't rhyme. It's not a rhyming thing like you're used to or something. But this is actually a poem that Paul wrote, or at least that he put in here, um, that was, so just hear it, hear it, hear it out, okay, ready? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created, 
that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, do you all hear that? That is something that is, uh, that, that's something that it sings even in a greater, gr- even greater than just the sum of its words. Even great, that it's, it sounds beautiful to your ears. That is what the word of God is. It, it rings and it, it, it hits your heart. It says, yes, there's something there. I mean, if you, if you just look at the lyrics of a song, you might be like, okay, that's pretty good. But for some reason, when it's all put together, it, it, the, the song itself carries something that is greater than just the individual words by themselves. And that is what your Bible is. That's why you don't want to change a word. Amen. It knocks it out. That's why you don't, you know, just you change a word in your King James Bible. It's just like pulling a couple words off of a song. It doesn't fit right anymore. Amen. It doesn't ring right anymore. And that's why you can hear someone quote a Bible verse and say, that's not King James. <laughs> because it doesn't sing like the King James sings. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't accept any substitutes for your King James Bible. You might end up with a with a ver- with a, a, a Bible full of lyrics with no music, and no one talks about that. No one cares about that. But your Bible is not just lyrics; it's music too. It'll make your heart sing. It'll lift up your heart. That's why when you read it and when you hear it, you walk away. You're like, man, I feel like I just listened to a good song, because that's what your Bible is. It's 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 beautiful. It's a it's it's poetry. Now you may have you may say to yourself, and Brother Broussard said this earlier. He said. You know, have you ever wondered why God just didn't give us a list of things to do in the Bible, right? Because it'd be easy if we just had a list of things to do. A lot easier. And and some people will say, why didn't God give us a systematic theology? Why doesn't he give us like chapter 7 on charismatic tongues? (laughs) You know, and here is the theology of tongues. Here is the theology of the deity of Christ. He doesn't do that. He doesn't, doesn't, or at least it seems that he doesn't do that. But he kind of does in certain areas. You know, there are theological statements all throughout the Bible that take the words of God and they stew them down into something that, that gives it a theology. You know what a theology is? A theology is a single piece, a single teaching that, that stews down some, something great or something about God. When you're studying about it, it's a, it's a single teaching that, teach, that, that helps us to learn more about God himself or God's words or God's creation, whatever it is it's talking about there. And so this right here is a theology, and it's written in a poem. There are other places, like look over at Philippians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Look, Philippians chapter number two. You may have seen this before. Here's another one. It starts with the word who as well, verse number six. Uh, Philippians 2, 6. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now that is a theology of the humility of Christ. This is the seven or seven steps there. This is a song with seven steps downward that Jesus Christ took when he reached his hand down to us. That song says when he reached way down for me, he had to, when he reached down his hand for me, he had to reach way down for me. He didn't just reach down. He came down. He came down to us. He, Jesus Christ came down to us like if you ever been over to somebody's house and seen a, like a little kid playing on the floor and you see like Brother Manning is a grandpa and he's got a little... A grand, a grandson, a granddaughter playing, and he's down there on the floor playing cars with them. And you go, brother man, I didn't know you liked playing with cars. He doesn't care about playing with cars. He wants to spend time with his grandson. Amen. And he knows that his grandson's not going to get out there and turn a wrench yet. And he's not, he's, he can't hand his grandson the controls to an airplane yet. So what does he do? He comes down. And he gets down. He gets down on his knees. And he gets down a little further. And he gets down there. And he says, I can play in the dirt with you. 
I can, I can do that for you. That's, the, that's what that theology of, of Philippians chapter 2. That's what that is. And so that is, that, see, that's God, God gives it to us in his words. So if you go through the book of Psalms, all kinds of theology in the book of Psalms. All kinds of theology. Uh, Psalm, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm chapter 2 says, it talks about the kings of the earth and how Jesus Christ is going to be, turn over to Psalm chapter 2. <laughs> Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now, you say, Brother Stan, why doesn't God just give us a theology? He, he does. He gives us all kinds of stories in the Old Testament about how Jesus Christ is going to be the king one day, right? He gives us stories about there will, be, there will come a Messiah, right? All of that he does. But then he gives us a single Theology of the king in Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon thy holy Hill Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like the potter's vessel. <laughs> Do you see this? Uh, be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. If this is not instruction and theology, I don't know what is. If you were a king, you would say, that's loud and clear. Uh, serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Verse 12, kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You know what that is? It's a theology. Now, if you didn't get a blessing from that, it may be because you didn't have all of the rest of the stuff that was behind it. But if you get into the nitty-gritty and read into Deuteronomy about the kings, read in the book of Kings about the promises of the king, then by the time you get to Psalms and read the theology, it all comes together and it sings. And you understand what he's saying. Look back over at Colossians chapter 1. I'm trying to hurry here. Colossians chapter 1. So this... Wisdom, the wisdom that we're going to be talking about, I'm going to go into that poem there about Jesus Christ, but if you'll, the wisdom that we're seeing here is about Jesus Christ having the preeminence. It's about him having the central place in your life, the central place in your heart, the central place in your walk, the central place in your thoughts, the highest place, the foremost place, the first place, all of these things are laid out in this passage, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That is wisdom. Young people, do you know what wisdom is? It's not, you know, uh, uh, what's the, the penny wise and pound foolish and, you know, uh, save uh, something today and say, no, a penny saved is a penny earned. No, it, that's not wisdom <laughs> according to the Bible. Wisdom in the Bible is Jesus Christ. You know, what, you know what older people see when they see a wise young person? They see a young person who has placed Jesus Christ at the preeminent place in their life. Amen. And when they see a young person who has placed the Lord Jesus Christ in their walk with the Lord as the, the highest question, not what will my friends think about me. That's a foolish person says that. Not what will this do to my, you know, to my job. Or to, that's, that's what a foolish... What a wise person says is, what does Jesus Christ say about this? Will this be pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ? Look over at Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Um, oh, it's in verse 10, it says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. This is the question that we have to be able to ask here. And this is what we're going to talk about as we go through this. The wisdom and understanding, and I'll just fly through this here, is um, look at chapter 2 in Colossians. You start to see some warnings there. Um, we're not going to just talk about the positive things. We have to talk about the warnings that are here because you have to contrast, contrast the negative and the unwise and the foolish things against the wise things. 
Um, you'll see in verse number 8, teaching is a philosophy in the traditions of men. You're going to see in verse 18, teaching around spiritual things. That's very popular these days for people to be spiritual but not religious. And they've got crystals and they've got, you know, uh, oils and they've got uh, tarot cards and they've got all kinds of stuff, but they don't want to be religious. They just want to be spiritual. In verse number 9, there's a teaching that Jesus Christ was a good teacher but not God himself. Um, in verse 20 through 23, there's a bunch of religious activity that wasn't part of their walk with God. It's just a public show. All of this, these are things that Paul is warning the church of Colossae about here. These are all things that he has to be careful of. So you have to, and so that's in chapter number two. Look over at chapter number three. Um, knowing God's will has, has to do with how you ought, how you ought to walk. Getting your mind on the right person. See verses uh, 1 and 2 there? Getting your mind on the right person is going to be fundamental to your walk with Jesus, to, to, your, to, to your success in Jesus Christ. Getting your mind on the right person, on the right place. And then look down at verse number 11, verse number 12. It talks about things that you put off, and those are sins that you put off in, the, in 7, 8, 9, 10. And then verse 12, 13, you see um, how... We live with others. Knowing God's will has to do with how we live with others. Not just how we act ourselves, but how we act around our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Um, this is something that's going to be uh, a, major, a major issue with this. When you do these things, um, look at verse chapter 4 and I'll end here. When you do these things, when you focus on, on the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ, when you focus on contrasting the things that are trying to draw you away from that, the worldly wisdom that's foolishness um, to, to the Lord. And when you are careful about how you walk, what you take off, what you put on, when you're careful about how you deal with others, and you, you align your life and orient your life to be able to, to focus on those things instead of all the stuff that it was focused on before. Think about that in contrast with the way you lived your life before Jesus Christ. The selfishness, me first, everybody else next, jostling around. I, I don't care. It's my, it's my last piece of pie. It's my, it's, you know. When you contrast that, then in verse number 12, he says you, you can be perfect and complete in all the will of God. See, it's not just, you know, young people, I say, well, what about, how can I find the will of God? It's not about just calling up the Lord one day after you, don't, you haven't spent any time orienting your life around Jesus Christ. And you're just going to call up the Lord and say, Lord, I need to know which college to go to all of a sudden. That's not how it works. I am telling you, I do not know of any scripture that says that you can live your life your own way, not pay any attention to God, and then call him like a, uh, you know, a, a wise man sitting on a mountain and ask him which college to go to and have him give you an answer. You, you're going to get an answer. You have no way to know whether that's your heart or whether that's God. You have no way to know. You know, if I wanted to build a trailer, can you imagine if I went to Home Depot one day and called Brother Manning and said, Brother Manning, I'm at Home Depot. Which metal should I buy for a trailer? He would say, what are you talking about? I mean, he's, he's built quite a few trailers in his life. And he'd probably start saying, well, brother, what are you trying to do with it? And what do you, you know, where are you going with it? How much money do you have? What's your budget? And what are you trying to haul? And what are your tolerances? And what kind of welds are you using? What kind of, all kinds of stuff that I have no idea that. But I promise you, when he walks into Home Depot, he knows exactly what God's will is for that metal. He knows exactly what to choose. Because he's been living in it. And it just comes out from his orientation, his life. Absolutely. All of y'all know that if you've been in careers for any given period of time, someone calls you and asks for your opinion, you're like, well, I, just, I can't just tell you over the phone. That's a big question. Yeah. And that's what it's like, young people. You can get you, the first thing to do is to get your life oriented around following Jesus Christ and walking in Jesus Christ. And as you do that, the will of God is shown to you by Jesus Christ as you take each step of the way. He shows you sometimes through help from older Christians, sometimes through your Bible, sometimes through your... But he starts to show you 
and you don't, it just doesn't become some type of a magic eight ball that you get down on your knees and shake it and God gives you an answer. It comes as a natural outflow of your walk with Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so difficult to answer that question. What's the will of God for my life? That's why it's so tough to answer that. And it's why it's something that you have to be walking with God in order to be able to get. Okay, so I'm going to close there and just say we'll, we'll get, that's an overview of Colossians. We're going to get into each, um, we'll go through it verse by verse or at least passage by passage here. And, and please be praying for me as I study it. There's a lot of different ways we could go with it, but um, I'm really, it's, I'm very, very much appreciative to Preacher for allowing us to go through this and allowing me to teach it. And I pray that it's a blessing to, to us as a church as we go through it. Amen. All right, Brother Swain, would you close us in prayer, please, sir?